So here's a fun scenario for you. A happy family is doing happy family things, when all of a sudden the youngest kid says a naughty word. The family, not knowing how to respond, just bursts out in laughter. As a result, the kid learns that saying that word gets attention and makes people laugh. And so the kid starts saying that word more. Ah, uh, classic, you think. And of course, being a psychology student, you meant classical conditioning, of course. But actually, why isn't this a case of classical conditioning? Well, the answer is that this new behavior shown by the kid isn't an automatic reflex response, but a conscious learned behavior. We call this operant conditioning. So operant conditioning is a type of learning in which behavior becomes controlled by its consequences. It's important that you know the difference between this and classical conditioning. As mentioned before, classical conditioning deals with involuntary responses, such as salivation or fear response, whereas operant conditioning deals with voluntary behavior. Classical conditioning was all about pairing two or more stimuli, whereas operant conditioning is about pairing a behavior and a response. Let's expand on this. This is Boris Friedrich Skinner, professor of psychology at Harvard University in the 60s and 70s. He was a prolific author who wrote 21 books and 180 articles and thought to be one of the most influential psychologists in the 20th century. Skinner proposed that all behavior was the result of conditioning. In other words, there wasn't really such thing as truly free will. We choose all our actions based on the consequences of previous actions. Now, we're not going to get too philosophical here. Humans are very complex creatures. But Skinner did perform a number of famous experiments with pigeons, who are arguably less complex than most people. So while Skinner was a grad student at Harvard, he created an operant conditioning chamber, which we now call a Skinner box. The one he made for pigeons had a little disc on the wall, which when pressed would deliver food, but also an electric grid on the floor, which would shock the bird. Sorry, pigeon. Skinner found four ways in which he could teach the pigeon to press the button more or less based on the consequence. I'll go through them one by one at first and then summarize them in a table. In the first situation, the starting condition or the antecedent was that the pigeon was, well, hungry. And the chamber was set up so that if the pigeon pushed the button, seed will get released into the feed tray. Notice the very convenient ABC way that we can outline operant conditioning. Naturally, as a result of this, the pigeon learned to peck at the button more often to get food. This is an example of a positive reinforcer, that is, a consequence that strengthens a response by providing a pleasant or satisfying outcome, thus increasing the likelihood that a behavior will be repeated. But there was a second way in which the pigeon could be taught to press the button more, although it starts in a not so nice way. The antecedent in this case was that the pigeon was already being shocked by the electric grid. But this time, whenever the pigeon pushed the button, the electric shock would be removed. So you can see how the pigeon would also learn to peck the button more often. This is an example of a negative reinforcer. That is, the removal or reduction of an unpleasant stimulus in response to a behavior, thus increasing the likelihood that a behavior will be repeated. Notice that both types of reinforcers result in the behavior occurring more. But Skinner also wanted to see if you could get the pigeon to push the button less. And so in this new situation, an electric shock will get delivered only when the button was pushed. And as expected, the pigeon learned to peck at the button less often. This is an example of a positive punishment that is providing an undesirable or unpleasant consequence that decreases the likelihood that a behavior will be repeated. Now, it might seem a bit strange to call it a positive punishment because punishments aren't positive, but it's positive in that you're adding something to the situation and also to distinguish it from the final type, which is a negative punishment. And so in the fourth case, which I admittedly made up, I don't think Skinner actually did this, but hopefully it works to prove my point. The antecedent was that the pigeon was receiving food, but whenever it pushed the button, food would be withheld. This should cause the pigeon to learn to peck the button less often, and it's the example of a negative punishment. That is, a consequence that involves removing a desirable or pleasant outcome, thus decreasing the likelihood that a behavior will be repeated. As promised, here it is summarized in a table. So remember that reinforcements are to increase behavior, and punishments are to decrease behavior. So positive reinforcement means adding something to increase behavior, for example, providing a reward. A negative reinforcement means removing something to increase behavior, such as taking away something that's unpleasant. On the other side, a positive punishment means adding something that will decrease behavior, such as something unpleasant. And finally, a negative punishment means taking something away to decrease behavior, such as removing a reward or a positive outcome. It should be noted that negative punishment is also known as response cost. 
Before I move on, I should say that students often mix these two up because negative reinforcement really sounds like you're providing a punishment. But you just have to remember that in this case, reinforcement means that you're trying to increase the behavior, whereas punishment tries to reduce it. So here are some real life examples of all four types of operand conditioning. An example of positive reinforcement might be if a class gets extra playtime because they obey the teacher's rules. This one's usually pretty easy to understand. As for an example of negative reinforcement, remember this is taking something away that's bad, might be perhaps when you eat ice cream and the sad feelings go away. Which, by the way, is really not a sustainable coping mechanism. A positive punishment might be if a kitten gets sprayed with water when it scratches the furniture. And finally, a negative punishment might be if you ran a red light and got fined. So we want to punish the bad driving behavior, and we're doing this by removing something good, money. Now it has to be said that applications of operand conditioning are very wide, but also very powerful. For example, operand conditioning is a very common way in which appropriate behavior is taught to kids or students. We can even gradually shape behavior by reinforcing attempts or tries, even if they're not perfect. Operand conditioning is also the basis behind many behavioral therapies and approaches, some of which you yourself might have experienced. And it should also be mentioned that even though there are four types of operant conditioning, they're not really all equal. If someone is punished frequently, it can result in them feeling frustrated, helpless, or even aggressive towards the person giving the punishment. Skinner himself warned against overusing punishment to modify behavior. These days, psychologists recommend using reinforcement over punishment to teach good behavior. An example of this is a movement, I guess you could say, called positive parenting. Google it to find out more. And finally, you might recall that for classical conditioning, we discussed generalization, discrimination, extinction, and spontaneous recovery. Guess what? These apply for operant conditioning too, although somewhat differently. One main difference is that when we talk about generalization and discrimination of the stimulus, we're not referring to the conditioning stimulus, as in classical conditioning, but generalizing or discriminating the antecedent. That is, the environment condition, whether it's similar or different to the original. I'll give you an example soon. Extinction is similar when the behavior disappears after the reinforcement or punishment has ceased. And finally, spontaneous recovery, which is when the behavior can randomly just reappear after a period of rest, which to some is proof that you can't easily unlearn a behavior. So here's my final example, back to that naughty child again. So let's say that instead of just saying the rude word when at home with the family, the child starts saying it whenever there's a group of people around, such as, I don't know, in the middle of a church service. Yep, another great story for the 18th birthday. This would be an example of stimulus generalization because the child has generalized the antecedent or the environment in which they should perform their behavior. Of course, we want them to discriminate the stimulus or environment and know that it's only appropriate to swear with your family at home. Actually, that's not even true. We don't want the child to swear at all. And so we can make that behavior extinct by removing the consequence, which is everyone laughing or reacting. You might know that one of the best ways to help children when they throw tantrums is to not give in. Because if you do, you're teaching them that that behavior brings about their desired outcome. Eventually, if no one responds to the rude word, the child will stop. Of course, after a while, spontaneous recovery might occur for no reason. But still, just ignore. And guess what? Now you know everything there is to know about being a perfect parent. Well, that's it for operant conditioning. In the next lesson, we're going to have a look at the third type of learning, which happens socially. Socially.